Good evening and welcome to The Strand. I'm Christina Foxley, the Director of Events, and I'm so pleased to welcome Charles Seif here tonight to discuss his new book, Proofiness, The Dark Arts of Mathematical Perception, Deception. Excuse me. Did you know that studies suggest that female sprinters will soon break the sound barrier? Or that Good Morning America announced that natural blondes will be extinct, extinct within 200 years? In Proofiness, Charles Seif shows how mathematical misinformation pervades and shapes our daily lives. Charles Seif is the author of Sun in a Bottle and Zero, which won the Penn Martha L. Brand Award for First Nonfiction Book, and was named a New York Times Notable Book. Seif received an MS in Mathematics from Yale and is an associate, associate professor of journalism at New York University. He has written for Science Magazine, New Scientist, Scientific American, The Economist, and Wired, among many other publications. Following his presentation, Charles will be happy to take your questions. I'll be walking around with the wireless microphones. Please wait for that before we, you speak. And then he'll sign copies of his books for you, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. We do have some signed stock by the color over here. Uh, please join me in welcoming Charles Seif to the Strand. Thank you very much. Everyone hear me? Is this level good? Okay, great. Proofiness is kind of like a mathematical analogy uh, to truthiness. It's the art of proving with mathematics what you know in your heart is true, even if it's not. Uh, these lies can be silly, but mathematical deception can be deadly serious. It's undermining our democracy. And this is because numbers have a peculiar ability to disarm us. If a lie is couched in the language of mathematics, we swallow it. When I say mathematics, most people think of formulas like this one. And I'll explain what this one is later. And this one. What is calipigianus? Let me put it another way. This is a formula for the perfect butt. Uh, yes, this was an actual study. Think you've got a booty to rival Beyonce's? Now you can find out with scientific certainty. A team of British academics has developed a mathematical formula to determine just how perfect your posterior is. And the Rosetta Stone of Bootylicious is S plus C times B plus F divided by T minus B. Well, if you believe that this has any scientific I've got a bridge to sell you, and I've got a perfect derriere. <laughs> Perfectly reasonable people will disagree on what makes a really nice butt. And how could there be an objective, whoops, pardon me, uh, how could there be an objective standard for what perfection in buttocksness is? Uh, and what if some scientist said, I have the ability to tell you what the perfect rear end is? Well, you'd laugh him out of the bar. But if he does the same thing with a formula, he gets headlines. In fact, this is just one of dozens and dozens and dozens of bogus formulae that are nothing more than attempts to get media attention. For example, there's the formula for happiness, the formula for the perfect handshake. And I don't know whether you can see this one. It's really complicated with the square root sign and all sorts of things in there. It was a, a marketing gimmick by Chevy. There's the formula for the perfect pancake the formula for the worst day of the year. And uh, this one actually was a gimmick by a travel agency to try to get you to travel over winter break. Uh, with a formula like this, you get lots of free press. These are silly examples, but this sort of thing is everywhere. People are deliberately lying with mathematics, even in the most respected journals. This was a study that came out in 2004 in Nature. Now, Nature is pretty much the top peer-reviewed uh, journal in the world. It's where all the scientists want to get published. Uh, it's the hottest scientific stuff uh, gets published there. Uh, in 2004, Nature publishes this article, which looks at how sprinters uh, were able to run the 100-meter dash in various Olympics. The authors took the data, used it to generate a formula, and projected that women would run faster than men. Uh, this is women's times. This is men's time, and you see they cross in the year 2156. So after 2156, women would be running faster than men. This is obviously wrong. 
Because if you take the same formula and go further out, down here, uh, by the year 2600, women would be running faster than the speed of sound. A few years later, they would be running faster than light and traveling backwards in time, uh, winning the race before it actually began. Uh, this is obviously ridiculous. What's worse is that there's no question that nature knew it was wrong. Here's a headline. Two experts say women who run may overtake men. If women's running performance continues to improve at the rate which it has soared since the 1920s, the top women will soon be running as swiftly as the best men, two physiologists say. The researchers suggest that elite female runners have been getting so much faster at such a rapid pace that they should be running marathons by qu as quickly as men by 1998. 1998? Yeah, this was a study that came out in 1992 in Nature. It's got the same bogus idea in it. You take a formula and try to project forward. Uh, but the dates were different. And the prediction that women would be running faster than men on the marathon was way, way off. Uh, the current record, men's record, is two hours and four minutes. The women's record is two hours and 15 minutes, roughly 11 minutes apart. And both are significantly greater than the two hours and two minute uh, crossing point that they projected back then. So they were wrong. Uh, they were proved wrong by time. And nature didn't care that these studies were obviously wrong. They published them anyhow. And that's because the journal, along with the scientists involved, got a lot of attention, a lot of press, and a lot of prestige. Uh, often when people use proofiness, they're trying to get your attention, like nature did. And once they get it your attention, watch out, because they're going to try to sell, uh, sell you something. Sales pitch is next. A number of years ago, I went to a facility, uh, which was a very high-tech facility that was trying to build a variant of power plants. And the facility was getting its funding cut. Uh, and the spokesman uh, used proofiness to explain why we need more power plants. It turns out that the spokesman is now a member of Congress, but he gave me a sales pitch and he threw up a slide like this one. And this is a graph that shows a relationship between two things. The horizontal scale is a measure of how much energy a society produces. The vertical scale is life expectancy, a measure of how long the citizens in a society live. And as you see, the two properties are linked. As energy consumption goes up, so does life expectancy. So the more power plants, the longer uh, people live. Uh, the opposite is true with infant mortality. If you plot infant mortality against ener energy consumption, you see that more power plants means babies die less often. Uh, so the message was clear. Give us money so we could build power plants or the babies will die. <laughs> This is a classic example of what I call causuistry. There isn't what's termed a causal relationship between energy production and life expectancy. That is, it's wrong to say that one causes the other. It's true that there's a relationship between power plants and life expectancy. The more power plants, the longer you live. But this doesn't mean that building power plants will save babies. For example, you see an even tighter relationship between these two concepts. The vertical scale, again, is life expectancy. A horizontal scale is a measure of how much time a society spends on the internet. So the more people in a society that use the internet, the longer the people live. So the message is clear. Walk down your butt at the nearest internet cafe. Obviously, this is silly. Uh, even though that there's a relationship here, it's because of technology. The more technologically advanced a society is, the longer its people live. The more technologically advanced a society is, the more power plants it has. The more internet it uses, the uh, fewer infants die. Uh, the more cars it drives, the more edible underwear it eats. It doesn't mean that eating edible underwear causes you to live longer. It just means that these things are linked because of an underlying issue that is technology. And just because two things are linked doesn't necessarily mean that one is causing another. Pretending otherwise is false. It is causuistry. 
and it's everywhere. How many of you in the audience, I'm curious, uh, don't eat or drink NutraSweet? Anyone? Yeah? A lot of you. Why? Is it, how many of you, it's because of brain cancer? No? In the mid-1990s, there was actually a scare that put a lot of people off of uh, NutraSweet. And it was because it was linked to brain cancer. And uh, there was a scientific article that noted that brain cancers were going up, up, up from the mid-1970s onwards to 1992 is when this uh, study ended. Uh, interestingly enough, this rise in brain cancers was caused, uh, was, was a few years after the introduction of NutraSweet. So this scientific study naturally suggested that the rise in brain tumors was caused by the introduction of NutraSweet. Was it really? Well, there are lots of things that were going up in the 70s and 80s. Sony Walkman, leg warmers, the budget deficit. Actually, this last one is pretty interesting. If you create a graph that plots brain cancers versus deficit spending, you see a really nice tight relationship between the two. And in fact, brain cancers actually leveled off in the mid to late 1990s when deficit spending was starting to get under control. Uh, is deficit spending causing brain cancer? Of course not. Neither is NutraSweet. What was really going on probably has to do with the introduction of a new piece of equipment, MRIs, which were first introduced in the mid-1970s and got very popular shortly thereafter. MRIs allowed doctors to spot brain cancers earlier, and as a result, you got an artificial spike in brain cancer uh, rates, which then leveled off. So, sure, NutraSweet uh, rose, and so did brain cancers, but to say that NutraSweet causes brain cancer is casuistry. Casuistry isn't the most egregious kind of proofiness out there. Sometimes, pe sometimes people make stuff up out of whole cloth. They create numbers that have no basis in fact whatsoever. I call them Potemkin numbers. According to legend, Grigory Potemkin was a noble in Russia who didn't want the empress to find out that a region in the Crimea was completely barren. It was a wasteland. Potemkin felt he had to convince the empress that it was a thriving hub of industry. Uh, so he constructed elaborate facades of villages that were crudely painted uh, that looked like villages if you didn't look too carefully. And the empress, who breezed through on her carriage, looked out and saw the villages and thought that everything was great. Uh, but Potemkin numbers are the equivalent. They are numbers that are facades, that are deceptive, look like they have meaning, but if you look at them carefully, they disappear. They only fool the unwary. For example, Glenn Beck recently had a rally. I'll let the master here, Stephen Colbert, say it for me. Now, no one's, no one's exactly sure how many people were at Glenn's rally. The only scientific estimate put the crowd at 87,000. But again, that's a scientific estimate, and I don't think many people at that rally were interested in science. <laughs> Besides, there are more accurate gut-based numbers available. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who traveled there from all over the country. What you saw was a minimum of 500,000 people. We're not going to let anybody get away with telling us there were few than a million people. Man, I would hate to be there when Michelle finds out that Glenn said only 500,000. So this sort of nonsense is not only coming from the right. A decade and a half ago, Louis Farrakhan held a rally. He called the Million Man March. The National Park Service did crowd estimation at the time, and they estimated that there were only 400,000 people there. Uh, and immediately, Farrakhan threatened to sue. The Park Service, as a result, stopped estimating crowds.